Hey folks, it's T Tuesday 3119. Uh, uh, the, here's the goals for this time. Uh, here are the results. It's win some, lose some. I've got a lot of stuff to show you, a lot of stuff to talk about, so it's going to take a while. So let's just dive right into it. Uh, I was cooking these little video segments <laughs> till right up until this, uh, this morning, so I apologize in advance. They're a little bit long and a little bit rough, but let's get into it. The bigger and more immediate issue is heat. It's time to move on that. So I ended up going with this AC Infinity stuff because it seemed the most plug and play. And it was supposed to get mounted in the cabinet. The bookcase doesn't have a cabinet front, so I started making little bits to on the 3D printer. We get power on the and fan it doesn't say temperature sensor switch over to tile so we can see the temperatures Title's not supposed to be there. Didn't have time the to temperatures re are awful. The speeds are awful. Let's see if anything happens here. So if I'm pulling air out the back, then I need to close off the uh, holes in the front so that air gets forced through the made these assholes. Should actually do us for a while. actually see this happen on the so, so I went and got a second one of the thermostat can three take fans on each side. Let's try to do the unboxing correctly here. Power supply, this is a very aggravating thing. This is a USB format power supply, I believe. Yeah, a USB A connector on it, but output six and a half volts. Great. I love it when they do I know why they do it, but I love it. Alright, and here is So they call it the S7, it's the triple, and this box is beautiful, whereas the original box got had a ding here and the plate was, was bent. This corner of the plate was bent back. And USB with a daisy chain, there's also a speed controller on this one in case you want to use it separate, but my plan is to plug this into the thermostat that we've got. Uh, which has two outlets and we should oh and we have another one of these power supplies this is actually uh, going to be extra so i didn't really need to buy an extra one because we're all right well we'll have an extra one but assuming we manage to um build you know lotus four, five, six, seven, um, and we want to continue this uh, cooling approach, which maybe we do, maybe we don't. I mean, I think uh, it's, the early returns are, it's, it's plausible. You know, theoretically, you're supposed to use this template to put it on your cabinet or your door. Instead, I've got these 3D printed things uh, that I whipped up uh, that are, I'm using it on the other one of these, it seems to work okay. The idea is uh, it goes up in behind here and the holes line up and that supports it so we get the height that we want to get. That's pretty good. 
so that's what we've got get us up above Lotus 1 where we're going to use some foam core just to kind of lay it over uh, the top of this thing. Six. This one is now 800. It's already gone up. Uh, uh, so that's encouraging. Uh, uh, this one is now at a thousand, and this one is now at a thousand. Hooray! <laughs> yeah, uh, all right, everybody. All right. I've got two little fans. So maybe we'll just save that up for now. Uh, um, I want to get some more experience with these. I have to anchor them somehow. Uh, uh, maybe just a piece of foam core running all the way along the top from edge to edge and just, you know, tape it on or something like that so that they can't fall outwards or, or inwards for that matter but uh okay well most of the heavy lifting was was done by getting the house cooling going for the summer the swamp cooler but uh now we've got what passes for spot cooling here as well step by step i made this plate to connect pieces of foam core to the end because I, I got a bunch of foam core but it's uh something by 20 by 30 and I need something closer to 50 <coughs> so I'm going to take a couple of pieces a couple of strips of this and try to connect them end to end using this um, <laughs> this little clip technology that I made on the 3d printer I got no idea if it's really going to work this is the test Now, according to YouTube, the key to cutting foam core with an X-Acto is to have the knife, the blade way out there and, and come at it at a low angle. So we'll give it a shot. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I mean, it could be worse. Quite a bit worse, and yet, for my purposes, it's actually still usable. Could be worse. Yeah. Alright. <coughs> that is 
it. First test of foam core cutting, not so good, uh, drilling. Come on, Forstner bit. But all very plausible. If I had like... That is the... Uh... It's working. <coughs> Not working amazingly well, but it is it is working as well as yeah, that one's actually sucking it in pretty good right there. So, okay, um, sorry about that. Uh, the uh, the smoke test at the end, <clears throat> it was hard to figure out a way to, to actually video to, to get the smoke in there, but it, it is the case that if you, if you get close enough to the actual tiles, uh, a lot of times near the serial port, uh, you can see it actually is getting sucked in. So it's something, I mean, there's lots of leaks all around that could all, you know, this was just a first demo and you know, it works okay. and. I just wanted to add one thing. Well, so so number one, uh, really the bottom line uh, was that you know we, we had to get the the cooling going for the summer for the house, and that made the main difference as far as cooling off the grid, which made the difference in allowing the uh, CPU speeds to uh, rebound. But uh, the fans, uh, I think they do help, and we now have a pretty good regulation. And uh, I guess let's see, can we do this? No, uh, this. Uh, is the live temperature graph using the USB temperature sensor that I got a couple of weeks ago. Uh, uh, this detached bit over here is from before the last update. This low part down here is when the grid was turned off, uh, uh, and this is daily cycling in temperatures. Uh, this is when the grid got turned on to start simulations that I'll show you in a little bit. Uh, and then this was temperature cycling, and then, you know, here, I guess we could zoom in on this. Uh, um, <clears throat> was, uh, so right there <laughs> is where the, the swamp cooler, uh, we got the swamp cooler started up, so it's all kicking in. Uh, uh <clears throat> and now that the regulation is actually fairly good, uh, I think part of these things is due to the thermostat on the uh, fans turning on and off. I increased the set point on the thermostat by one degree uh, uh, just as a test. Uh, uh, right at this spot here, uh, uh, right here, and it did for a while seem like it was actually reacting and made a difference. Hard to tell for sure, but uh, bottom line, uh, all now 57 tiles are running at one gigahertz, which is as good as they can do. So uh, um, what I wanted to uh, talk about in the, the bigger picture of this is the four givens of indefinite scalability. And, you know, uh, this is this goes back to the original paper talking about indefinite scalability. It, it, the, the whole idea of doing an indefinitely scalable computer architecture, well, the question is, you know, what do you get to work with? Uh, what, what are you allowed to assume you've got? And what you're allowed to assume is the four givens of indefinite scalability, power, cooling, real estate, and money to buy tiles. And, and you know, that kind of goes without saying, but it's actually important and as you know indefinite scalability is slowly getting traction out in the world I, I hear it echoing a little bit more from places uh, from time to time but as it gets from you know uh, being ignored to being laughed at and then fall uh, uh, the four givens become more important because it actually makes a difference so the fact that I'm worrying about heat here is officially speaking not the fault of the indefinitely scalable architecture you know 
you know, on the one hand saying, you know, you can assume power and cooling, you can assume the power and cooling you need, that sounds like, you know, an invitation to climate destruction, you know. Uh, um, and, you know, to some degree, I will take that hit that, uh, you know, we would like to have our indefinitely scalable machinery be uh, run very cool and be uh, power efficient and so on and so forth. But uh, in order to get enough room to do research, uh, we say let, let, we're going to put that off the table as a, a requirement and instead just turn it into a, a desirable feature, a quality rather than a requirement. A and so we'll compare data sheets, you know, how much power and cooling does this particular approach to indefinite scalability take versus that one. Same thing for how big they are, how much real estate they need, and how much they cost. Uh, uh, so, okay. So that's just a reminder uh, that uh, <coughs> uh, we uh, deficit scalability is built on assuming those four givens, and those are an IOU that they all have to be paid off in order to get a completely embodied system, as we just saw in dealing with heat on the T two grid. Okay. So that's the development story. The research story has two angles. Uh, uh, there's the, once again, the new engine that is uh, uh, supposed to be more robust and flexible and so forth. Again, I did not actually work on it. I'm going to put it off the table for now. And, and that means this, uh, we're going to continue to live with the existing code base, which has these explicit known robustness failures. In particular, uh, once a, a tile is taking part in a computation and it has any interactions other than than just all empty spots, all empty sites with its intertile connectors, uh, you cannot uh, shut that tile down without causing failures on the neighboring tiles and you get these crash storms and so forth uh, uh, that happen. Uh, that is all gonna have to be revisited, but at the moment I am more attracted, more drawn to wanting to explore higher up. Uh, uh, and that's the other direction that I did go in this last two weeks. It was also about having a little bit of fun. Uh, uh, Ringo off the plate, the Ringo, the ring oscillator that I've talked about a lot that was sort of, you know, kind of a key innovation of last year as far as uh, I was concerned. Uh, uh, so let's talk about that a little bit more. So Ringo, Ringo.ulam is a particular set of code to do this ring oscillator thing. The general idea is GDRO, GDRO, the generalized distributed ring oscillator. And the question is, or a question is, is how general is the generalized distributed ring oscillator, uh, you know, and the stuff that we did uh, last year was pr all pretty much built on top of the plates, the L1 plates and the L2 plates. And it did show a certain amount of generality in the sense that the same thing that did the L1 plate, I don't know exactly how that actually got to be half green and half blue. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, but, uh, you know, it's all rigid within a plate. And if this generalized idea really is more general, can we take it off the plate? And that's what I went after this week, uh, this time. And, and, you know, fundamentally, the way that the GDRO uh, looks at the universe, uh, it doesn't need 2D plate. All it needs is a notion of upstream and downstream and derivative from that, that if there's no upstream, then you're the root. And if there's no downstream, then you're the tail. And that's it. And the, the rest of the rules are built into the Ringo, the generalized distributed ring oscillator approach. So if we can come up with a notion of upstream and downstream, then we could try to play this game. So I said, why can't we do something that instead of being a 2D grid with the root in the upper left and the tail in the lower right, what if we have sort of a amorphous cloud where there's a root in the center and the tail is the entire periphery, the mem uh, you know, a, a molecule, a cloud, a membrane of sorts, and have that uh, uh, do Ringo on that. So that's what this is about. We've got two demos to look at. The first one uh, is I was just building up the infrastructure to do this. The first one doesn't use uh, uh, Ringo. The second one, V11, does. Uh, uh, let's take a uh, look at it here. Uh, uh, which one is it? It's this one. Um, and yes, we have to start it explicitly. Okay. So one that will yeah, get one, two. I'm multiple. I'm putting in multiple seeds there. Uh, um, and each one is just this little thing. Okay, and the fourth one triggers an interaction, and we get this. <laughs> You know, and you know, when I saw this, I said, wow, this looks really cool. Let's put it on the grid and see what happens. Uh, um, 
this is full of bugs. I don't completely even know what's going on here. I eventually figured out where the that big cell membrane, the big orange rim came from. But essentially what's going on here is those original yellow things, they declared themselves to be a root with their uh, their hop count is zero. That means they're the root. And they spawned more gas cloud molecules near them that looked around and said, oh, I see a zero, that means I'm a one. And then they spawned more and they say, oh, I see a one, that means I'm a two and so forth until they got up to 14, uh, uh, which is the limit of how many hops we said this experiment you were allowed to go. And if you were the 15th, one, then you were supposed to decay because that's the special trigger. Uh, now here, uh, we switch to, uh, all right, so let's hold this up for a second. Uh, um, and so that was pretty cool. And the point was, was that these, the gas cloud molecules could move around and when they would wake up or the neighbors would wake up, they would once again, they would just search their environment and take whatever the minimum hop count they saw and make themselves a uh, hop count one more than that. Uh, uh, so I tried to say, okay, well, why don't we start with uh, that gas cloud and now say, do Ringo, uh, uh, that if you're the root, uh, uh, if you're, if you're hop count zero, you're the root. And if you're uh, hop count 14, if you have no downstream, uh, if you have no things that are further away than you, if, if you look around and you're the biggest hop count, you can see that means you're the tail, even though that means, you know, the entire periphery of the cloud is tail. Uh, uh, and I tried to get the thing to sync as well as bop around like that stuff was doing. Couldn't get it to go. So I said, okay, let's try to do something more simple. And that's what this one is. So what we have here is, let's let it go. Uh, uh, we put out a root that spawns a cloud the same way, growing out the same distance, but then it starts to cycle. And now you see they're not actually moving, and that's the difference. These now just grow like plants and then stay rooted. But it, when you're a periphery, when you're one of the tails, you have you throw a low odd, a rare die, and if it comes up heads, you say, oh, I'm gonna spawn another seed, which rattles around, tries to find an empty space, and then creates another root. So what we're seeing here is a whole bunch of roots that are cycling together. And I didn't even know that this was gonna work. So they're not completely in sync. Uh, and there, look, it, it, it locked up because there's some configuration that uh, it, it got into a, a deadlock. You know, I don't know whatever it was, but I had a background watchdog timer that the root says, I wanna be a jerk. Remember the root is the one that keeps making things different. And the tails all say, I'm gonna follow you. So the root has an additional timer saying, if I've gone this long and failed to be a jerk, uh, uh, then I erase myself. And so the, all the hop count ones look around and they can't see a hop count zero anymore. So they uh, increase, they, they basically, when the root disappears in this particular approach, the whole cloud just goes with it. So what happens is, is now once again, this thing is cycling, it's coordinated, but it's not slave locked. They, look at that. Uh, I really love it. You know, it's like you got sort of like different organs or different pieces of a larger thing that have their own local centers, their own local business. But uh, in addition, they uh, coordinate with the things that they touch. We've increased the, the time lapse speed now, so you see it going quicker. Uh, um, and this is the way it goes. The, the, as, long as, there's, as long as the tails are cycling, they may toss off new seed seeds uh, and so here we have a, de a detached thing where we've got two bits that are cycling independently but eventually they throw a seed in between them which then gets them coordinated maybe that causes them to lock up and so forth this is a fascinating dynamics this is multi-scale structure just you know almost for free it's almost just what Ringo wants to do with the root being the center and the tail, the hop maximum hop count, whatever we're doing for size being the, uh, the tail and cycling back and forth with that. So I have some additional ideas about how we might be able to, uh, you know, all the things that I did so far, trying to get this cycling going while also having them move around like was happening in gas clouds V1, that it didn't cycle, they, they would just lock up. Uh, uh, but I, I have some additional stuff that I haven't had a chance to implement. You know, and even as it stands, you know, there's actually that part in the lower left corner there that, uh, it has been stuck for a long time and I'm not entirely sure what's going on there. It's still running. It's still stuck, in fact, as far as we know. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping 
I, th I suspect what's happening is that the root that's locking it up it managed to get the root into you know a, a triple corner uh, which requires three locks and it's the slowest to get events so it just hasn't timed out yet but I'm not actually sure okay uh, th this goes on for a while but let's say we've gotten the idea here and so uh, that is the uh, generalized Ringo and, and I'm pretty happy about it I think uh, uh, you know breaking out of the idea that there has to be one tail or even that there has to be one root uh, uh, but when there is more than one tail or more than one root then the spatial interactions that follow that fall out of this thing get resolved in a reasonably natural way uh, so okay so that that was my uh, both <laughs> some research stuff and some fun stuff for uh, this time. Okay, so that's the research story. Uh, uh, outreach. I have two uh, little bits to talk about. Like I said, this is a long one. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, so one of the uh, goals for this time was to increase the rejection count on my little science fiction story, short story, Search Quiet Wake, SQW. Uh, uh, I failed to get an additional rejection because <laughs> I didn't turn it in yet. Uh, uh, but I did actually make some progress. I did engage with the text and started to make a few changes that I had accumulated from talking to people and thought about and so forth. So I'm going to repost that as a no fooling uh, for next time. But in addition, right after the last T Tuesday update, uh, I went to one, I did one of these virtual uh, Santa Fe Institute workshops that there's been several of them over the last uh, year uh, uh, on embodiment and uh, embodied, situated, and grounded intelligence implications for AI. A and I missed uh, the first day, April 12th, because that was the last T Tuesday, uh, uh, but I attended virtually for the rest of the week. And, you know, it was, it was really great. It was a lot of fun, uh, uh, you know, a ton of smart people and a very diverse group. So there, you know, there were philosophers, neuroscientists, social scientists, uh, as well as computer scientists and biologists and, you know, you name it. Uh, um, and, you know, and the fellow in the middle there, uh, John Krakauer, he is a neuroscientist and, and you know, and, and he had a lot of thoughts uh, uh, about uh, approaches to intelligence and how to understand the brain and the mind and, and cognition in general and so forth. And, you know, and he and I kind of got into it a little bit <laughs> over the last several days because, because you know, he, he actually wasn't all that happy with a lot of approaches that people had taken, uh, including a, a, a lots of computational approaches like that. So, so that was a lot of fun and, and I really enjoyed interacting with him. At one point in the chat that goes with the Zoom, he made this, this comment uh, uh, talking about something that had been previously discussed. That is the classic move. Squeeze interesting cognition until it is crushed by embodiment from one side and culture on the other. This is explaining away from these two sides will not get the job done in my view like that. And, you know, when I looked at that, it was like, you know, you know, except for the negative part about it, that seems really right. Uh, um, and so, you know, I made up a, a slide or two, and when it was, you know, one of the discussion periods, you know, I raised my hand and, and I, I made the pitch that, you know, well, you know, what else could it be? Yeah, uh, maybe uh, the way we should understand the job of inter what interesting cognition is, is by implementing it by combining embodiment from one side and culture on the other, where the point is, is that embodiment writ large in general computer architecture means the implementation. An embodiment is an implementation, which doesn't just mean the registers and the instruction set. I mean, it also means the energy and the heat and the deployment and the cost and the entire... Uh, uh, physical aspect of the machine. That is the implementation. That is the embodiment that has tremendous consequences. A and on the other hand, we are not just implementing arbitrary machines. We are implementing a programmable machine specifically. And that means that we can be reprogrammed by culture. We can be reprogrammed by code that we receive while the machine is running after it's been built. That's the essence of programmable computing. Embodiment is the implementation of the machine. Culture is the code that we transmit that's running on the machine. All right, that sounds just right. It sounds like a very good way to understand the big picture. Where does something in the mind come from? It comes from either the implementation as a programmable machine, or it comes from the code that's running on the programmable machine. Crush interesting cognition. Uh, uh, so that's it. Uh, uh, all right. 
so this has gone pretty long. Well, half hour, okay, so be it. Uh, uh, next Tea Tuesday will be on May 10th. Uh, um, my goal is, you know, I've had this this uh, paper intro that I've been supposed to write. I'm way late on it. That now goes to the top. I got to ship that overdue paper intro before we talk again. And I need to also submit uh, science fiction short story, Search Quiet Wake, going to submit it to Clark's World. Uh, uh, and then the thing, the fun, right, what I actually want to work on is, so can we put uh, Gas Cloud V1, V10, and V11 together? Can we get it to do its distributed cycling while also moving around a little bit, jiggling around and going for it? Uh, uh, we shall see. Uh, but that's uh, the news for T Tuesday 3119. Uh, thank you so much for stopping by. Hope to see you next time.